Hi guys, my name is Johnny Lucas and we're going to be looking at a special video segment today called What Makes More Sense? We take a look at two opposing topics and evaluate them to see which one makes more sense. Simple, right? So today we're going to be looking at the Bible's account of creation versus Darwin's evolutionary theory. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis, it tells us that God created all of the living creatures on the face of the earth and in the sea and in the air, each according to its own kind. It also tells us that God created the very first man and woman to walk this earth. They were able to walk and talk and plan from the very beginning, and the first commandment that God gave them was to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So that's essentially how mankind and all the creatures on the earth got their start according to the Bible. So now let's look at the evolutionary theory. It stems from the 1859 book titled The Origin of Species by author Charles Darwin, who was also a naturalist and a biologist. It holds the premise that every single living organism on the planet are all related and that we've all descended from one single and very simple common ancestor. It proposes that over time, more complex genetic mutations occur to benefit the survival of a given organism, and those organisms without genetic advantages will die off. This is known as natural selection. And this is how you would slowly get diverging in various species over time. He offered up this illustration known as the tree of life. So now that we briefly define the creation account and the evolutionary process, let's evaluate them and see which one makes more sense, all right? So what we're gonna do is use some scientific principles and we're gonna pose the same questions for each subject. All right, question number one. What are the core contrasting differences between the biblical creation account for life on earth and Darwin's evolutionary theory for life on earth? The Bible claims that all life on this planet was created at one moment in time by an all-powerful, intelligent God. Whereas evolution claims that the life forms on this planet are the result of a series of successive genetic mutations that resulted into the life forms that we see today. What evolution fails to yield in contrast to the creation account is the origin of life. If we are indeed descendants from simple single-celled organisms, how did these organisms come into being? It's a question that must be addressed if you're going to hold on to the evolutionary theory as a belief. In 1952, a Jewish American chemist named Stanley Miller conducted what was called the origin of life experiment. The experiment sought to see if microscopic life forms could be produced by recreating Earth's early atmosphere using a series of gases that were thought to have been the atmosphere's composition at that time. The gases included hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor. These substances were put within a sterile glass container and the contents were sparked with electrical discharges to simulate lightning. After five days, Miller discovered that a few simple amino acids had collected at the bottom of the glass. The experiment was seen as a success at the time, but it was later discredited because further scientific analysis over the years led the scientific community to believe that the Earth's early atmosphere was actually made up of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water, which is what volcanic gases were producing. The experiment was performed again using these substances and no amino acids were produced. But more importantly, neither experiment was able to produce life. And sure, it's one thing to be able to create amino acids, which can be considered the building blocks of life, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to create life itself. Just because you have a couple of bricks doesn't mean that you have a building. In fact, you could even take a living cell, cut it open, and put all of its contents into a sterile environment, and you still wouldn't be able to create life within it. Meaning that it's not enough to just have the proper building blocks in place, you still need a life force in order for an organism to enter into the state of living or being alive. And thus we have the scientific observation known as biogenesis, which states that any new living organism can only be created from an already pre-existing living organism. So while the God of the Bible claims to be living and the sole progenitor for all life on Earth, the theory of evolution does not offer any basis for how the first life forms came into being. And since we're searching for answers to events that have happened ages ago and are long since past, let's see whether creation or evolution makes more sense in the light of paleontology. So according to Darwin's Tree of Life illustration, in our fossil record, we should be able to find fossils of similar form and structure gradually branching out and turning into the more complex and varied skeletal structures representative of the vast amount of creatures we see today, with the oldest skeletons looking very simple. And according to the Bible's creation account, in our fossil records, we should be able to find a vast variety of skeletal structures fully developed and appearing all within a short instance of each other, with the oldest ones being similar in structure and complexity as the present ones. 
So what do we actually find in our fossil record, you ask? Well, our fossil records indicate that about 543 million years ago, there was an appearance of nearly every major living animal body plan in our fossil record. This is referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. In other words, almost 543 million years ago, fully grown and developed animals were suddenly present on Earth's surface, much of them looking just as they do today. The Cambrian Explosion spans a period of 20 million years and paints us a picture that looks less like a tree, as Darwin supposed, and more like individual blades of grass sprouting up on the surface. So put plainly, the bottom part of Darwin's tree of life does not exist in our fossil record. Meaning that from a paleontological standpoint, the Bible still makes more sense than evolution in light of the evidence we've uncovered. So you might be asking yourself right now, if all of the information presented in this video is true, then why on earth are all these people out there still clinging to Darwin's theory as a hardcore belief? And why on earth is this theory taught in our schools as if it were factual when it is indeed theoretical? Well, here's something that might blow your mind. If Charles Darwin were alive today, he would be asking the same questions. Huh? What are you saying, Johnny? I'm saying just this. If he were alive today, he would tell all the students, teachers, and scientists alike who have held on to his theory and grabbed a hold of it as truth that they are wrong. Yes, wrong. But before Charles Darwin did that, he would first tell you that you were wrong because he was wrong. In fact, in the very book from whence the evolutionary theory came, Darwin made a very important statement in light of his observations and proposed theories. Darwin said this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Such an organ as Darwin described here would be known as an irreducibly complex system. This is a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that all contribute to the basic function of the system. And if you were to remove any one of these parts, the system would effectively cease to function. So to help illustrate this, we'll use a bicycle and a mousetrap, okay? A bicycle is a complex system, but it is not an irreducibly complex system. Meaning that I could remove major components of the bicycle and it would still function as a vehicle of expedited transportation. For instance, if I remove the seat, I can still stand up and ride. If I remove the front wheel, I can still wheelie on the rear wheel. If I remove the whole front portion of the bike, meaning the forks, the wheel, the handlebar and all, I've effectively turned it into a unicycle yet it still functions as a vehicle of expedited transportation. Thus, it is not an irreducibly complex system. A mousetrap, on the other hand, is an irreducibly complex system. It's made up of five components, all of which are required in order for it to perform its function. Component number one is the catch. This is where you place your bait, and this is also what triggers the trap to activate. Component number two is a thin U-shaped rod called the hammer. Component number three is a torsion spring. It provides the speed force with which to bring down the hammer. Component number four is the holding bar, which keeps the hammer cocked back in place. And component number five is the platform on which the entire system is mounted. If you remove any one of these components, the system will not function. Or put another way, the complexity of the mouse trap does not allow for a reduction in parts while maintaining its function. Thus, it is an irreducibly complex system. All the components must be present simultaneously in order to function. So now that we understand what irreducible complexity is, given our advances in microbiology and the study of single-celled organisms, we are now privy to much more information than Darwin had back in the mid-1800s when he published his theory. And what have we uncovered since then? we've uncovered the evidence of biomolecular machines. Inside large organisms are a series of organs that perform specific functions. All of the tissues making up these organs, as well as the organism itself, is comprised of microscopic cells. Interestingly enough, these small cells contain organs and components as well. So there's organic complexity even down to the cellular level. So let's look at just one component of a single-celled organism. And since we talked about transportation earlier, let's look at the flagellum. The flagellum is a hair-like, or rather a tail-like appendage that's used to propel the cell through a given body of space. It is essentially an outboard motor, much like what you'd find on a motorboat. First, you have the propeller, which on the flagellum is called the filament. Next, you have the U-joint, which is called the hook. You have the drive shaft, or rod, and you have a stator and a rotor. There's roughly 40 different protein parts needed to comprise the five main components making up the flagellum. And the only way for the flagellum to work is for all five components to be in place simultaneously. 
An outboard motor cannot gradually just develop in a single cell organism out of nowhere. The evidence of these irreducibly complex biomolecular machines are what Darwin pondered on when he was discussing what type of finding would result in debunking his theory. Remember what he said? He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So there you have it. The man Darwin himself would consider his own theory discredited in light of recent discoveries. And even if you tried to somehow salvage Darwin's theory of evolution, you'd still have the question of information. Where did the engineering information required to construct an outboard motor on a cellular level come from? Where did it come from? And if all life on this planet could somehow be traced back to a single cell, you would still have the question of what or who gave that cell life? Because the science shows all life on this planet can only be created from a living organism. So in conclusion, we examine scientific experiments, paleontology with the study of fossils, and finally microbiology. And in each instance, the biblical account of creation still made more sense than Darwin's theory of evolution, which only seems to be refuted more and more over time as each of these fields of study progresses. So thanks for watching, guys.